Hey Frank, how are you doing? Uh, fine. It's uh, it's um, very nice of you like to spend a bit of time with me on this, uh, I guess, some sort of video podcast. Um, I wanted to start by asking you because you you live in New York. Um, looks like New York is sort of the epicenter of the coronavirus crisis in the in the US. What's the what's sort of the situation on in New York on the ground uh, at the moment? Oh, it's fucking horrible. My neighborhood that I live in is usually it's quite a noisy neighborhood. You know, usually there's some construction that I'm complaining about. And uh, the only sounds that we hear in my neighborhood now are uh, ambulances taking people to the hospital. There are so many people dying in New York right now. And uh, because of our shameful, shameful system, there are huge uh, shortages of any sort of protective gear for people working in the hospitals. Like a few days ago in the Bronx, nurses actually had to do a protest because they were being asked to wear the same mask for five days. Like five, five fucking days, they wanted these nurses who are intubating people to wear a mask. And so the nurses, you know, they stood out on the lawn in front of the hospital uh, with signs saying that their lives mattered. New York is a pretty um, a hard place to be in quarantine because the apartments here are really small and they don't have balconies the way that, you know, they might in, you know, Italy or Greece. So my mom, for instance, lives in one tiny little room. And it's just really, it's hard, right? For someone, you know, to be stuck in one tiny little room, you know, alone day after day after day after day. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, I love my city, I'm from here. And I think New Yorkers are some of the best people on earth. And there has been this complete outpouring of mutual aid. Uh, yesterday, for instance, I, I so I, because I'm an artist, I had a lot of um, extra latex gloves because, you know, we use them, uh, to, me and my boyfriend, we use them to paint, right, to protect our hands. And so um, there is a group that formed to distribute latex gloves to, uh, to frontline workers and to people who are like running errands for old people and stuff. And so, yeah, yesterday morning, there was just a lady on a bike that came, you know, came by my building to pick up my gloves. And I just like left them outside the door. There's also this knowledge that uh, our city is going to be completely abandoned by Trump, that Trump does not care if we die, that he's not fulfilling the request for ventilators, that he is um, trying to uh, demonize New Yorkers as sort of this like vector of disease that we brought on ourselves by being, you know, crowded and dirty and cosmopolitan and not being sufficiently racist or whatever. Uh, in um, Rhode Island and also in Florida, uh, National Guard is uh, stopping people um, either with New York plates on their cars or, you know, who are coming from New York. Um, or even sometimes they're going like house to house checking for people to make sure that they're uh, observing like a two week total quarantine. So it's a difficult time. A lot of people who are rich have fled the city. People, you know, who have summer homes, right? Or, you know, else a lot of people who, you know, aren't from New York, right? Who, you know, come from come from the suburbs or come from the Midwest have tried to go on, tried to go home. But, you know, people like me, like this is our, this is our home, right? And yeah, it's just, it's a really hard time. And there's this real feeling of dread every day because like how many of your neighbors are going to die, you know? Yeah, I was actually um, listening to uh, the mayor of New York, Bill, Bill de Blasio, um, it was yesterday or something, who was saying that in two weeks, New York, like hospitals and stuff, were going to run out of supplies, which is a very scary thought, right? You know, nurses now, like now, are wearing garbage bags as personal protective gear in New York. This city has a higher per capita percentage of billionaires than any city in the entire world. And our nurses are wearing garbage bags to protect themselves. And, you know, as much as I, I loathe Trump, this is not just Trump's fault. It's also uh, the fault of having a mayor and a governor that are utterly subservient to the wealthy. Uh, Bill de Blasio was criminal in dealing with um, the corona outbreak. He was going to the gym and telling people to like go to bars and go to restaurants 
long after, you know, even the governor was trying, was telling people to stay home. Like his own staff was threatening to quit because he was being so unobservant of, um, you know, of, of social distancing. Meanwhile, you know, we have a governor, Cuomo, who like sounds very calm and confident on TV and has been getting a lot of good press. But he is like trying to cut Medicaid, you know, which is like basically like the health insurance for poor people. He's trying to cut that right in the middle of, the, of this. So the extreme, extreme class stratification of New York is coming into this like really, really cruel focus right now where, you know, the people who do the work, right, the people who deliver the food, the people who um, clean the buildings, the people who keep the city running are, um, you know, risking death every day with very, very, very little reward, while the governor won't even, you know, raise a tax on billionaires to fund for them to get enough, you know, protective gear. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a question, I guess, you, you can ask all over Europe and, and the world and, and, yeah, even in the US about the seemingly an unpreparedness of, of politicians. But you got to ask, because I spoke to a few scientists and stuff that were telling me, we've been telling politicians for 10 years, if such uh, a pandemic happens, we're not ready. So, you know, blood will be on their hands. And, 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 and what do you make of the response or the non-response of Trump, who like, what, six weeks ago was calling the coronavirus a a ox and or, or something, right? Um, what do you make of that? I mean, he's not a rational. He's not a rational actor. Trump is a mixture of an infant and a fascist and a lunatic all at once. Uh, he wanted to deny that it was happening as long as it, as long as he could. And then when he couldn't deny it anymore, he wanted to shove the blame onto people other than himself. But um, I think that there's something deeper than Trump, which is, and this is, I think, what's so horrifying about Corona. At least some of the reason that none of us have been prepared is that the steps to fight Corona, corona are horrible in the same way that chemotherapy is horrible, right? They're, um, they're horrible because they cut you off from everyone you love. They destroy small businesses. They destroy human connection. They destroy solidarity. Everything that we know, right, about how to protest or even like how to, you know, how to be friends, the coronavirus destroys that and makes that impossible. And to me, that's the reason why people from the most diverse backgrounds in the world, right, um, everyone from like libertine spring breakers in Florida to like pious Greek Orthodox Christians have not observed social distancing, right? It's something that does, it's not one, any one demographic. It's not any one group of people, any one like language, any one religion, any one bit of politics. It's that no one wants to observe social distancing because social distancing goes against who we are as humans. And um, yet we have to do it because that's the only way to keep there from being mass death. And I think that um, the painfulness of social distancing was also part of why our countries have been um, so unprepared. Uh, the third reason is that social distancing destroys economies. Um, I mean, especially, you know, in New York, right? This city is very dependent on, you know, uh, arts, uh, entertainment, events, restaurants, uh, hospitality. I have so many friends who lost their entire incomes overnight who were just, you know, ruined, right? And I think that a lot of more local politicians they tried to stick their head in the sand and not um, not do the social distancing that needed to be done because they knew about the real horror that it was going to unleash financially. Now, the thing is that if America was like a civilized country, if we actually had a social safety net, if we actually, you know, had a civilized healthcare system, if we actually cared about keeping people in their homes and not making them homeless during this crisis we could mitigate some of the pain. We couldn't mitigate the loneliness. We couldn't mitigate um, the psychological toll, but at least, at least people wouldn't be all going bankrupt in the middle of this. But we don't have a civilized country here. And everything about the brutality and lack of social safety net in America has excavated this crisis. Everything about it has made it worse. It's made it so that people who are sick, they don't go to the doctor, right? They don't seek treatment. It's made it so we don't have enough ventilators because a company that was going to, um, you know, produce cheap ventilators, you know, what was it like 10 years ago, just got bought out by a bigger company. 
it makes it so that pe companies they stockpile masks so that they can um, you know make money selling them at jacked up prices makes people homeless in the middle of this crisis. It makes people stuck in jail because they can't afford bail in the middle of the crisis. Every single thing that's cruel economically about America is also making us die more from Corona. Talking about dying more, um, there are a lot of people in um, ICE uh, detention centers. So ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, you did quite a lot of work around ICE. Um, I, re I was reading an article in the, the Guardian UK a couple of days ago by an Iranian scientist who is stuck in one of these detention centers who was saying ICE is going to let COVID-19 kill many, many people. What are, your, what are your, sort of your views on that? Oh, it's absolutely true. There are 40,000 people in ICE detention right now. And ICE... At a time when America has a shortage of masks, at a time when nurses are not able to get masks, ICE requested 45,000 masks for their agents so they can go into people's homes, to steal them from their families and lock them into these, um, these detention centers that have become petri dishes of disease. Uh, there are hunger strikes all over the country uh, because, because of this. I mean, you know, Bergen-Belsen was not an extermination camp. Bergen-Belsen uh, was transit camp, uh, but many, many, many people uh, died in Bergen-Belsen because of disease, because it's impossible to keep clean in a place like that. Uh, my friend's uh, great-grandmother died in Bergen-Belsen because of that. And that is what they are turning these detention centers into. Um, and if this country had one iota of humanity, they would let they would release every single person from those detention centers. Um, but instead, uh, they are basically preparing for mass murder by disease, in my opinion, and there's no other way to say it. There's no sugarcoating it. Um, and one of the things that's also very hard about this moment is that it's almost impossible to protest, right? In August, I was uh, deliberately arrested, um, you know, protesting ICE, and I would frankly be terrified to get arrested now because I they would put me in, you know, overcrowded jail cells and I'd probably get infected by Corona, right? People are, are trying to um, protest in different ways. For instance, a lot of people have been driving out to the ICE detention centers and driving around it in their cars and, you know, holding signs out the windows and honking and screaming. But the types of protests uh, that we can do have been uh, very, very limited. Um, I called up... Um, a local jail where I was holding some people. And um, when I, I finally like got through to someone and the receptionist refused to give me her name and just hung up on me. I also wanted to ask you something um, a bit more, I guess, uh, personal, because uh, we, most people around the world live very hectic lives. You either work nine to five, um, or you, you even as an artist as yourself, you, you tend to move about all the time, be involved, I guess, in a countless of projects and stuff. And it's not often that you can actually stop, or yet you can actually pause. Um, this time we we didn't ask to actually pause or stop; it was imposed on us. Um, and I mean, personally, I see it also as a way to self-reflect. Uh, you know. Where am I? Where am I in life? Um, what's the future holding uh, for me or for society in general and stuff? Do you have time? Like, did you have time so far to actually look sort of inwards, inside yourself? So, um, you know, I have to turn off the news because, like, every time you know, and a lot of my friends, you know, it's like this. Every time we look in the news, it's just this um, barrage, you know, of like boom, boom, boom. But I suppose it, it is a pause. I, I started um, growing a bunch of plants. I, I, I um, like I, you know, I had some tomatoes or stuff. I took took out the seeds. I started growing them. You know, started. And it, there's something kind of miraculous when you're not allowed outside and you're just looking out the window and you can like sort of see the city through these like tomato leaves, right? And you can know, see life. Um, I speak to my mother a lot because uh, my mom my mom lives alone. 
Uh, so we speak, um, you know, several hours every day. Uh, she's doing a beautiful, beautiful uh, drawing right now. My mom is like the most talented artist and she's, she's drawing from all of our old family photos. Um, I've also been working on a, a series myself of uh, portraits of people on the front lines. But in some ways, uh, there's actually not a lot of time because right now it feels like there's this real urgent responsibility to make sure our city survives this, you know? Uh, so I, you know, spend hours every day, like calling detention centers or hate calling politicians, um, trying to, you know, organize uh, mutual aid stuff, doing, you know, doing like phone conferencing, uh, just like checking in with your friends, you know, like for instance, um, one of my friends, she thought she was sick and there are no thermometers in the city. So, you know, she can't, she can't get a thermometer to tell if she's sick. And so I'm like planning, like, can I walk two and a half hours to my friend to like bring her a thermometer, you know, and lay it outside her door? Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of sort of stuff like that. Fortunately, my friend is, my friend is fine, but yeah, there's a lot of, um, just planning of how you like take care of each other. Right. When, um, there are just uh, real shortages of certain things. Uh, though, to be honest, there are not shortages of like uh, toilet paper and paper towels. That's all bullshit. All the immigrant stores have plenty of that. Of that. But um, there, yeah, there are shortages of thermometers. Um, what else have I been doing? I don't know. I've been um, cooking a lot, I, I guess. I have been um, living off of a takeout for uh, far too long. And you know, there's a lot of uh, domestic things that I have to do that I guess I've, I haven't, um, you know, I've been able to kind of outsource. But I feel like I'm just sort of getting back into myself for my for the first week, I I guess I'm just so angry, right? I'm so angry. I'm so angry that we live in this fucking city where nurses are dying all the time because they have to reuse the same mask and because they're wearing plastic bags. I'm so I'm so angry that we have, you know, thousands of people in Rikers for bullshit, right? Um, you know, I covered I covered misdemeanor courts. A lot of these people, what are they in jail for? Turnstile jumping, you know, for not for not paying two dollars and twenty five cents, you know, for a subway ticket, and now they're at risk for for death. I I'm angry about the detention centers. I'm I'm worried about all my friends that um you know, have no money now and no way to get money whose industries have just, um, you know, been destroyed and who aren't eligible for unemployment. Cause, um, in general, uh, people like me, we don't, we don't get unemployment right in America. We don't have any social safety net. So except right, we're getting 1200 bucks from the government. Uh, but, you know, I guess, I guess, yeah, I'm just, there's a lot of, a lot of anger and a lot of worry. And I think that that has, taken away um, time that I might have used for reflection if I came from a more civilized country. People are saying that there'll be a before COVID-19 and, and after COVID-19. But first, like, do you agree with that? And, and first, what do you think they, they mean by that? I, I absolutely agree with it. I, one of the things that's a little bit horrifying from an American perspective is that um, COVID-19 superficially can look like it validates a lot of the worst aspects of America, which are living, you know, in an isolated house, in an exurb, uh, driving around in a car, uh, you know, not living in a place that's dense, not living in a place that's diverse, not living in a place that has travel, right? And the uh, death toll in New York, um, it's being described in like conservative media in a very sort of culture war way. Like this is what New York gets because they're filthy and they live on top of each other and they're on the subway and look at them. They have, um, you know, a neighborhood that's all Chinese and they have immigrants back and forth. They're disgusting, cosmopolitan, degenerate um, filth. That's that's the way that it's being it's being um seen and it's being slotted into this this old right-wing narrative about the sort of revenge of um you know the exurbs or the revenge of the countryside upon the city and that's um really terrifying and that's a narrative that definitely plays into um the fact that 
the federal government is uh, denying uh, New York and denying other cities like Detroit and uh, you know Los Angeles uh, life-saving uh, medical equipment. Um, to me, a nightmare scenario could be um, a New York City in which there are no more small businesses, right? Because everything will go bankrupt, and where everyone um, who you know was anything but extremely wealthy uh, loses their apartments, and then just like massive, um, you know, massive conglomerates come in and and buy up all the real estate, and it just becomes, um, you know, it just becomes like a Dubai, you know, eventually. To me, that that's something very frightening, and I, I can see that um, I can see that happening if there isn't very real relief for normal people. Um, and especially, you know, in New York, in New York, 70% of people rent, right? Only 30% of people, you know, own their own homes. And even owning your own homes is kind of precarious here. So 70% of people, how far are they, right, away from, you know, being evicted? How, far, how precarious are they? If there was going to be... Um, I hate the idea that there's a silver lining of anything that's like the deaths of you know, probably tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of people. But if there was a, a better way that um, New York could recover, and I'm speaking about New York because I feel like our situations are all, um, they're all, they're all so different, right? Like I think that your situation in Brussels is probably so different than my situation in New York, which is so different, you know, than someone's situation in Gaza. So, I, you know, I speak about my own, my own situation here. What could happen in New York is if they're, if a lot of rich people got scared, if they left the city, and if the city um, again uh, became a place that wasn't just, you know, an investment vehicle of glass towers, right, but was a place for uh, the working people, um, the working people who actually who actually live here, um, I think that one of the things that has to be done is there has to be a radical uh, greening of our cities, and a radical upscaling in uh, food production and gardening inside our cities because. Um, if there's one thing that COVID has shown, it's that supply chains are incredibly, incredibly fragile and they're so easy to break. And um, part of um, pandemic uh, preparedness, in addition you know, to having enough ventilators, right, or being able to set up social distancing, is being able to make sure that places like New York get food. So if I was thinking of a, a just world after, um, after COVID, it would be a world where working people, where normal people um, are able to, like, stay in their homes, right, where people who don't have a lot of money have radically more rights to stay in their homes where they don't get just booted out all the time. And um, where cities are um, massively um, greener, where our rooftops have become gardens and um, where they're massively um, more self-sufficient. So those are two things that have to happen. And I think the third thing that that is happening right now is that people are realizing um, their intense interdependedness and not just in the sense of like, if you know, if you get sick, um, I get sick, though that is part of it. But also, you know, people who have never spoken to their neighbors are suddenly, uh, you know, going out and picking up the prescriptions for the old lady that lives near the, that lives near them, right? Um, they're doing all sorts of mutual aid just because we, we are all in this together, you know, in this series of islands. And, you know, we have to we have to survive together because no one else is really looking out for us.